And so I, uh, mentioning finding balance within this experience of body, which is fundamentally about establishing balanced energy. So you're not kind of, but all the energy is not bunched up in your head. Mm. It's not surging, rushing, crashing. You know, your head knows where your feet are. Mm. You know where your skin is, you can feel it. So instead of your energy flicking around, occupying certain inflamed territories and ignoring others, <laughs> getting even spread energy. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Do you ever track your experience in terms of just how it's affecting your your, your energy? You may not. What do you mean by energy? The sense of what you what you feel your presence is occupying, where you live. You could say, and I guess um, the condition has come around whereby average person would say they think in some curious way they live in a little room behind their eyes. You know, and they don't believe it, but that's the feeling of it. You know, and the rest of it's just kind of down there somewhere. Mm. Yeah. The back of the head's gone. And then that one. And uh, that becomes, oh, that's me. I mean, I am in my head. Mm. How strange, you know. Until, of course, you know, you get a thorn in your finger, then you're in your finger. <laughs> the finger suddenly becomes huge in your awareness. Just noticing where, where your energy fills and how it's uh, most of it will probably rush into this um, head territory. Mm. Uh, and that's uh, not some personal fault, that's because we Fundamentally, our environment is one, our real environment is one of symbols and concepts which your fingers can't manage. So you require hyper brain activity to manage numbers and letters and words and plans and strategies. But then, you know, just to recognize that that's the condition. Yeah. And when we're dealing with energy going to that, which is actually not tangible, mm. is abstract, yeah. it's actually shaping how we function. Because we would say something like eight, like the number eight, put it on a clock, <coughs> suddenly eight o'clock, and then you know, the sense of getting somewhere by eight or getting to a place at eight o'clock becomes extremely important because of when the bus goes or the train goes or the job begins, I'm going to meet so-and-so in a cafe at eight. And that, that urge, that pressure, that urgency, that energy, that, that number <laughs> and what stands behind it, failure, loss, guilt, blame, what stands behind it so captures our energy that we're prepared to panic, uh, um, be blunt, uh, be careless, dismiss people in order to fulfill that. Mm. We get frustrated because you're getting in where we're going to get somewhere by eight o'clock. So the ethical sense and the loving kindness sense is kind of, you know, definitely secondary to what that number can take can, can be signifying. Now, if that becomes a kind of pretty constant program, you know, what's happening is the ethical, kind and loving aspects, which we're all endowed with, kind of get depleted. You know, they don't get going to be nourished enough and actually, what we're, what we're dealing with is really other human beings who are also in this kind of same grid of eights and nines and this, that and the other. 
So you get a city of people who's kind of like, you know, there's loss, diminution of empathy and so on. And that's a huge effect. And we can look, I was just noticing, I think, the uh, current Prime Minister, let's not go there, uh, but one of his policies was to, to make sure that um, you know, English and maths were compulsory at A-level. English and maths. So you've got to take that to A-level. I thought, um, excuse me, sir, what about moral integrity and kindness to PhDs? <laughs> you've got to get a PhD in moral integrity, because I think actually some of the, excuse me, some of the people in Westminster could perhaps you know, take a few lessons in upgrading the moral integrity and loving kindness aspects. You know? Don't you think that'd be kind of useful? <laughs> you know, like mathematics, right? Okay, but mathematics is going to save the world. <laughs> uh, okay, you know, do a review of global catastrophe. Do a quick review of the uh, global catastrophe. Right. This is primarily driven by extremely intelligent, sophisticated mathematics, physics, economics. You know, not extremely sophisticated moral integrity and loving kindness. <laughs> what do you think the need is? <laughs> right. And yet, we go, oh yeah, good idea. We could then get a good job and you make progress in money and development building. You know. Look for the future, technology, look for a bright future, bright future, problems, look welfare in this country for the bright future, we're all going to have economic success. And oh, come on. <laughs> you know where that's going? <laughs> you know where that's going? Look where it's gone, it's taken us so far. Yeah. Are we happier? more comfortable, more peaceful. Uh -uh. Uh, it's more stressed, more driven. Mm. And uh, our, our animate condition, the animate condition, the living, vibrant, responsive, sensitive, fluent, uh, empathic condition goes down, you know, depleted between human beings and each other, between human beings and other creatures, and so forth, all the way down into planetary destruction. <coughs> so yeah, you know, okay, so this is the inflammation of the brain, or inflammation of the mind. doesn't mean that we don't, you know, just to make sure that we're just aware of this instant inflammation. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have to be brain dead or can't think. But just to get some perspective, some balance of the whole system. There's, there's thinking, there's emotional sensitivity, and there's embodied presence. Because, of course, also emotions get very inflamed. You know, your passion. Uh, love for pleasure, emotional uh, infatuations, uh, addictions, stimulation, not a big problem. Doesn't mean they're not help, not necessarily have sensitivity, but when sensitivity, you know, and, and the agreeable feeling is made dominant, then it, we lose balance. Can't say agreeable feeling is wrong, but it has to be balanced. This is why so often I'm returning to, to body, well, because body is the end of the story, but just it's the kind of the one you know system that can actually we can find where there is actually a sense of agreeable feeling. <laughs> it's quite agreeable, you know, balanced, steady, calm, you know, unstressed, you know. Not inflamed, not numbed out, not constricted. That, that's pretty agreeable. Doesn't cost anything. 
doesn't mean you have to consume anything. Doesn't derive anything of, of doesn't require to bust the plug anything in, doesn't require any energy. Just it's built in. You know? Uh, and so that and then you know, that actually does require intelligence, brain intelligence to keep wait no go wait no stop, wait pause, just what's happening there, you know? Then you're using that uh, mind attention in a in a way that is not splitting off into abstractions. <clears throat> but keeping this wholeness together, keeping the wholeness there. We also use the, the mind for investigation, inquiry, questioning. What does this mean? What's happening behind that? What's the feeling associated with that? Is that really so? Or is it just something I'm adopted as an assumption? We start to use the, our brain, our mind to inquire, investigate. Mm. What's it like to be with this? And, uh, you know, the simple, um, you know, system that the, is right there in the ancient scriptures, Vitaka Vichara. Vitaka brings something to mind. Vichara, linger, sense it. What's that? How does it feel? Bring something to mind. Concept could be a name, Aunt Sally. Linger. Oh, I wonder how she is. Mm. Tenderness, sympathy, irritation, whatever. Mm. Uh, simply bring something to mind. Pops in. Mm. How's that? How's that? Yeah. So cultivating like that. Now, you know, to, to do this, it's in order to, it's necessary to kind of clear, clear some space so that, because normally what, we don't have to, things just pop into mind, don't they? You know, we don't really have much handle on this, we talk, I just suddenly, oh my goodness, it's Tuesday, oh, what's happening? So and so, so and so, what's that? Pop, you know, things are just popping in all the time. And in a highly saturated media environment and the symbol and concept saturation that we're in, everything is everything has got words written on it. Everything is leering down on us. Everything is dangling baubles of pleasure in front of us. Everything is telling us we've got to buy this. We've got to go there. We can't do this. We mustn't buy that. We've got to go this. Watch out for this. Everything is screaming at us off the walls. You don't have to do any, you know, it's just boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Everything has been popped into mind, you know. And the problem is that eventually you don't do the vichara, you don't do the lingering how's this feel, because the next thing pops in, and the next thing pops in, and the next thing pops in, and five things pop in, internally and externally. Your own memories, your own um, imperatives, your own perspectives, plus that of the world around you. Yeah, and there's a point at which just the person really loses. They've got no no free room to put that Vitakavichara system onto something that would be more grounding. So again, people, basically the first thing that gets dropped is the body. And then they're just out. Uh, and then the heart is reduced to a simple urges. Mm. Based on fear and desire. Get this, watch out for that. Red light, green light. Mm. <laughs> so this is why we you know, actually put to develop some effort to get hold of the system, just stop. Don't place it there, you know. 
and it's just uh, then you you know to to uh, recognize what one needs to do that yeah. Mm. yeah so we use this body and still it's quite a test you know so sometimes you have to make the object coarser like standing so you have to be there or you're going to fall over Uh, you know, reading a couple of accounts of a couple of professional women who thought they maybe heard about this meditation or mindfulness stuff, maybe try a shot of that. I think one had a one of these um, apps whereby you, it, it's called, I don't know what it's called, you probably know it, but you, it gives you 10 minutes a day, you hear this voice saying, okay, just find where your body is, find your backside, feel your feet, stand there, just gently so, you know, 10 minutes, just hold it together for 10 minutes. And you have to try to do this for a year. She said, it's all right, 10 minutes, it's all right. She said, don't try this, you'll go mad. It's just too much, maybe one minute. Actually, not even one minute, one minute's a bit tough, but just take one breath. If you can be with your body for one breath, that's what, then start build up slowly, because 10 minutes is major. Wow. The other one, one other one couldn't do that. So it's a, a teacher saying, well, you know, you don't have to sit still. You can kind of walk, walking up and down, didn't do it. Well, you could lie, lying on the back, didn't do it. You get in a bathtub with hot water in it, with earphones <coughs> on, with a sinker, just about manage a little bit of that. So anyway, she eventually get in the body by running. Okay, so meditation is to take a run to actually get something that physical to, to connect. <laughs> yeah, the mind, I call it inflammation of the mind. Just so inflamed. Oh. But clearly, both of them, something felt, I want different, I want, I want, I want something's not right here. Was that? You know, that, that. That light is still there. Yeah. And then, then, you know, when you realize how how important this is and how crucial it is for whatever is welfare, you don't really get too fussy about systems of meditation. Like if you can do it standing on your head, do it. <laughs> if it means you've got to stand on one leg, do it. <laughs> You know, you've got to chant mantras or, you know, whatever to actually get out of the, of that, the flood. <laughs> yeah. mm. And perhaps it's um, not always so difficult. Mm. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the Buddha's saying, well, look, you know, four, you've got four positions. Everybody can do, you, you know, walk stand and sit like that and you can get you know really expertise and refinements on any of these but just get the basic thing there as a reference point and you can refine it in accordance with you know what, what works and to also to not to feel you've got to get that refined because that's part of our, our inflammation is is the search for expertise you know, we really believe in the excellent, the excellent, the most excellent, best, supremest, sharpest, precise, accurate thing is going to be the best. Yeah. I don't want the kind of ordinary someone that supreme, excellent, best, most, most crucially tight scrutiny. Anything. Well, not really, you know, because. Uh, uh, that's going to throw you out of balance. It puts too much emphasis on attention. Mm. Which is one important factor. But remember, attention is the selector. Select something that you can stay with. most important thing is you can stay with it. And you and it's it's embodied. It's some it's an animate thing. 
it's something you actually receive signals from, right? That's what animate means. It means you can be with something and you'll get feedback from, oh, I'm feeling that. Oh yeah, that, when I do it, they are. Then you're going to learn. Hmm? We're, all, we're all alive. Yeah. So we can know all that. When I, do that, when I put my mind onto that aspect of uh, my sensitivity, it becomes stirred or it becomes calmed. Ah, now I know. Yeah, I'm learning. This is this is the this is the field. This is the project. This territory. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to be that refined to notice that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you say just posture of the body. Mm-hmm. Right. Being with, say, it's sitting or standing, what's that like? What it's not like is it's not moving forward. It's not pushing or pulling. By itself, it's just, there it is. Oomph. You know? It acts like, a, the Buddha said, it's like having a, a post or a stake that you, you drive into the ground. And then your senses are like animals tethered to it and they're pulling out. He says, no, no. So you ram that thing into the ground and those, those creatures, that thinking mind, the eyes and so forth, are running out. And then they say, they're also they're, they're quarrelling with each other. But eventually if you just keep that and you keep bringing your attention back to that basic pillar, that post, you draw... You, by bringing your attention back to it, you draw energy comes back because where your attention goes, your energy goes. Remember this, because you, if your attention goes to your problems and so forth, they become inflamed, they become greater. If your attention goes to things you want and fancy and look like a good idea, they will become inflamed, they become massive. If your attention goes to things you've done wrong in the past, they become inflamed, you become saturated with guilt or regret. So where your attention goes, your energy goes. So if your attention goes to just this body, okay, let's get really basic around it. Backside, you know, legs, shoulders, hands, head. Is that it? What next? No, no, no what next, that's it. <laughs> what next happens by itself? <laughs> Well, I don't want to do this. What's the what I'm supposed to be doing here? Just be the, okay, that's a thought. But where's this meditation going to lead me to? Is this going to make me walk? Well, that's a, that's an emotion. Mm-hmm. Where are your shoulders? Where are your hands? How's the energy in your arms? Your fingers? How's your skin? When you relax the muscles in your head. Yeah. I've said remember these important things I've got to do. Of course. <coughs> okay, that's a thought, that's an emotion. So all this stuff just starts unfolding as you unpack. And you unpack just by staying still. This stuff comes unpacks all the all the packed up stuff. And then your training is to not follow it, but not not rejected eyes. Oh, this is the emotion called urgency or panic. This is the emotion called regret, uncertainty, anxiety. This is the emotion called uh, desire, wanting. It's just still the truth. There's no moral blame around this. It's quite normal patterns for, for all of us. Now how do I how do I then meet that? So the vitaka, so, so your analysis, your investigation, is a, there's a thinking, and sustain that. Now how does that feel? How does that thought train feel? Where's that train going to? It's going to urgency headquarters, isn't it? 
it's going that way, and the energy feel pretty inflamed. So inflamed energy can't take you anywhere except into the fire. The fire of worry, delusion, craving, aversion. That's it. It can't. That's what, that's what he's got it written all over it. I'm on fire. Where is it going? To the fire. <laughs> so he said, "Well, actually, what's the first? You know, when we're sensing that feeling of it, then our our heart intelligence begin to pick up this sense of what's our response coming from integrity and compassion. Call the fire. Don't throw more stuff on it." How do you call the fire? Space, sympathy, and then you can feel probably the energies in your body need to settle again. So we tucker, what comes to mind, what pops into your mind, and then you investigate it, what's that about, how does it feel, and then what, what does it need? What does it need? Not what do I need, I need, you know, to get to where da, 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 da. No, what does it need? It needs to, it needs to stop. Because that's what those trains are saying, aren't they? You get on this one, you'll get there, but then it'll stop. We'll get the things done, then we've finished now, it's all over. Mm. I'll buy one of those, I had enough, then I won't need anything. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very simple piece of logic, but it doesn't actually work. <laughs> There's such an appealing idea, <laughs> you know, it's such an appealing notion that human beings follow that, you know, to in micro, macro, you know. So, we've got a pest, well, if we kill the pest, then we'll be alright, won't it? Insect, pest, kill it, be everything fine. Or, or to, well, not really. Kill the pest, and what happens? Another pest grows in with resistance to it. Or you get something, some, once you've distorted the balance of nature, you know, you kill the pest, but that means the creatures who are feeding on that insect die out. You've got no, nature has no way of moderating it. So maybe the answer is, well, I've got to live with a few pests and say, okay, I get 90% rather than 100%. I get 80%. Maybe that's it, you know? So we're looking for perfection, looking for things to be concluded, looking for things to be at the best, looking for things to come to a best final conclusion is one of the dreams that we've never ever realized, never come to fruition and by and large, we're still in that dream. And so we've noted, uh, you know, the Buddha taught Dukkha. Dukkha means the general inconclusive, not quite right, could be better state. Things never quite complete, tidy up, finished, all over, that's that done. Uh, got to exactly the best bit, totally satisfied, that does not happen mm. in the conditions. Things just tumble and roll and tumble and roll and shift and change. And, and this is the other sign of Nietzsche. Everything is fluent, everything is changing, nothing ever finally achieves a final cohesive reality. Mm. Mm. We've been born and yet not quite because now I'm growing up, I need some more food, I need clothes, and then I'm growing up and I've grown out of those shoes, I need a bigger pair of shoes, it's not quite right yet, I need some education, I need some more education. I need some more clothes, not quite right yet, and I need to moral training because they're not quite right yet, and then I need to 
get to school, university, and I'll be fine, but I'm not quite right yet. I'm not going to advance training for this particular job because I'm not quite there yet. I've got all these things to do which I never quite get to the end of, but I will do one day if I work hard enough, so I'll do some overtime because I'm not quite finished my job yet. Um, And then I'll have a nervous breakdown. (laughs) (laughs) Meanwhile, I've got to look after my mother who's falling apart, or my dad is, you know, things are not quite right yet, but, 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 it's like this. And so then, you know, that sense of maintaining one's balance within this dukkha, conditionality. Mm. So then, you know, we can't. You know, know, again, the human culture often looks at changing the world. Sounds like a good idea more medicine, more laws, and so forth. Not bad idea. But we notice that no enemy laws we create. Criminality does not wane. <coughs> Just finds new ways to get around the laws. Create more alliances to keep world peace. World peace does not happen. World peace has never happened. It's Just the war goes somewhere else. You know. War has been constant for the last several thousand years through recorded history. Mm. Now we, you know, and then of course there's conditions for that. Now if we look into the causes and conditions rather than change the world, change the mind, change the operating system to I don't need to have everything that I want. I don't need to have things finally conclusive. I don't need things to be the best. Then maybe, sounds sort of like a bit feeble, but then perhaps when conditions are just, you know, I can manage, then maybe there can be more tension going into the places of integrity, compassion, loving kindness, relinquishment, you know, into this territory. This is certainly the theme of all Buddhist practice, and probably more than just Buddhists. They weren't idiots. So that sense of how is that going to come around, well we have to find some way of moderating the inflammations of the mind, moderating the, the careening of the heart, jumping, flip, you know, and so, okay, you know, so that if these are moderated, then they are like wild animals, and when they're trained properly, can serve, and they're excellent when they're properly cleaned and trained, and they train themselves, it's not, you know, just through this process of, well, how does that seem to you? Not quite right. We have, a, we have an innate learning system that's built in. Chitta, heart, awareness. Take everything there and you know, it doesn't feel quite right. Mm. Mm. Doesn't feel right to just be blaming everybody else. I can justify it, but it doesn't feel good. Mm. Doesn't feel good to be just holding on to this grudge. Doesn't feel right. Yeah. And so, if there wasn't this in some this innate purity. And also, just in the case of these two professional women, some fundamental sense of that's there somewhere. I want to, I want to get there. <laughs> then there surely would be no way out, but there is a way out. And uh, to get the readings of it, you know, the, the phrases that are used 
uh, about coolness and non-inflammatory. So this is not some great wow, wow, bang, here we got it, final conclusion, yippee, flags waving, trumpets blaring, it's a sense of mm, cool. It's called signless. It doesn't carry symbols and signals. It's the it's the, when the signaling quietens down, it's just still open. Mm. Signless deliverance. Mm. Now, so certain. Uh, I mean, there are certain very powerful structures that the uh, consciousness sets up. Uh, readings from the sens- sensory realm, reading the sensory realm, one of the fundamental structures sets up a sense of location, in which okay, now we're in a little hall in Gold is Green, in London, in England, da da da. I think we'd all probably agree to that. <laughs> and maybe in a few hours' time we'll be in somebody will be in Islington, somebody have gone off to Birmingham, somebody Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. How's that? Sound reasonable? <laughs> Investigate. <laughs> Investigate that. What what tells you where's what tells you gold is green? What tells you that? Name on a on a sign somewhere? Somewhere on Google Maps? There's no gold is green. You know, does the earth tell you that? Does the sky tell you that? Does the trees tell you that? Does your body tell you that? Yeah. And when you sit down in Birmingham or Glasgow or Islington, when you sit there, does your body say, oh, I'm in Islington. I'm in number 57 High Street, Penge. <laughs> no, it just says sitting here. Yeah. So, location actually is a direct experience has no name to it, no place on the map. This means we never leave it. So that helps us to kind of, you know, get out of the sense of, you know, belonging to a particular place on a map and owning it. Owning it. That's what comes in. Belonging to it, owning it. That's what's come in through that displacement of location and a direct animate experience to the names, the concepts. You know, before that was a very before there were maps, people just roaming around, you know, walking across forests or plains or plateaus or something. We're on the earth. Okay. And what ends there? The ending of nationalism, the ending of conflicts, the ending of boundaries, you know, the ending of ownership. You know. And the, and the natural priority is that how are we going to cooperate living on this planet with these very sensitive bodies with no claws, we can't run fast, how can we help each other? That's more likely. We we'll start owning things and having things and well, get out of mind, you know. <laughs> That's more likely, isn't it? How many of you have problems with your neighbours? 
<laughs> who won't because they don't cooperate. They can they keep making that racket at eleven o'clock at night. And they've done that terrible thing to the garden we're supposed to share, and they park their car in the wrong place because they because we don't cooperate because they got their place. You know, you know. we look at something like that. It seems kind of a bit abstract, but actually it has quite profound ramifications. Because if you understand your conventional location in wherever it is, like Islington or Manchester or somewhere, just that, and you come to your real location and say, well, yeah, that's true, I do have a flat in da 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 that's where I'm living now, but really what's important is to get this location properly run, tidied, you know, rather than fuss around in my flat and get all kinds of things in it, get this location, this is the real location, get this tidied, clean, good shape, you yeah. know. That's going to shift one's priorities, isn't it? And how do you do that? Well, working on your body energies is certainly one way to do it. Mm. Live light. So you're not chained to some place. Live light, cooperate. Location is an illusion. Time, not a big one. There's not enough time, too much time, time on my hands. Got to get somewhere on time. What time is it? All the, the, the sound, what those, all those messages feel like? What do they feel like? In balance, right? Not enough time. Yeah, means I've got to rush forward. Too much time. Kind of confused. Late. Failed. <laughs> I didn't get there on time. They're all about imbalance, aren't they? You're something rocking around your nervous system, trying to get that sense of coherence, you know, to be on time. Uh, so this, you actually get a feeling for it. It's a surge, a movement in the nerves. Nervous system. And as we probably recognize, it's, it's a convention uh, it's set up for our, I suppose, they make us as a, as, a, as a collective experience more orderly. So you think, how long is it going to take me to get to? Bristol. Well, I think traffic it could be a bit late for them. allow some more time to get through the traffic, traffic, you know. They're in the trains, but the trains sometimes, you know, they cancel them, so better get there an hour before that. But then again, some, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you get there on time and train has been delayed. <laughs> Please go to platform ten. Change it, Oxford. Da, da, da. <laughs> what happened to that? You know? <laughs> if it had been in airlines, I think I've travelled quite a bit in American airlines. It's probably, I reckon it's about one in three uh, um, journeys is either delayed or cancelled. So you get there three hours ahead of time. So you can wait three hours and then be told to wait another three hours and then the plane's cancelled. <laughs> but we're happy to serve you. Customer satisfaction is our number one priority. <laughs> we're not here to make money, we're here just to make people happy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, they're, they're kind of absolute emotional turmoil this this thing called time can create for people <laughs> the pressure and the, the anger when things don't arrive on time you know, you know, this is how useful is it then not how useful how real is it how real is it what's it referring to referring to 
something that's abstract, that could be, should be, might be, will be, I hope it will. It's always dealing with impossibilities that are not present, which have a certain pressure to to achieve them. And well, actually, let's just let that one hang for a while and see if we can experience, <clears throat> you know, present. And then future is uncertain, past is, could be foggy. You can just experience present time, present time. And in present time you feel these, how do you get that? Well, got to go into your body. Brain can't do it. What's present time mean? And the experience in that. And energy's moving, probably wishes, uncertainties, vibrating, you know, memories coming up. So and so to make something work, movement towards the future, all those eddies of present and past and inclination and happening now. Now, we well can, is it possible just to keep that post of mindfulness in the body just right there? And it's okay, you know, whatever the future may be, I can't determine yet, but I can notice that I just feel the, the, the pull of it. And this, what I want to do is keep that post, that pillar, of sati in the body present. Mm. Mm. And use that, spread one's awareness from that centering here and now present condition into the possibilities and the obligations and the wishes and the plans without dismissing them, just that. So the, what happens is the body's energy acts as a moderator by itself, not through me trying to calm down, but just holding that. That energy of the body acts as a moderator that moderates the energy of the mind. And if you stay with that, you'll find well, actually, um, yeah, that'd be a good idea, but might not happen. That ha- that comes to you. You don't have to kind of add some belief or ideology. You don't have to advise yourself. It's a self-education system. It's an education system that's self-educating beyond the notional self, beyond the person. Okay. So, because we have an innate learning system built in, it's called chitta, awareness, heart awareness. So, now is that, stay with that, and there's that possibility of Wednesday morning, really need to get that thing sorted out for the welfare of my sister, some of the hospital, absolutely really want to do that, just stay here and have that there, don't lose the balance. You're not dismissing that 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 item. So the energy then the energy is if you expand your energy to include the possible and the obliged and the wished for. Stay there and just use your breathing to act as the the regulator of energy. Don't have to deal with the topic regulate the energy so then that you know, something that begin, then they begin to think things begin to change by themselves which is we might find that that you know wish to go to the hospital support my sister who's having a difficult time becomes a sense of I really love her I really wish for her welfare beautiful nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that so that that kind of got to get to it becomes just something really quite heartful and we can dwell in that now yeah. 
And if we dwell in that and acknowledge that's happening for us, uh, how am I? I feel quite, you know, tender or... Okay, take some breathing, just steady yourself. Let that breathing steady in your heart. Okay, I feel quite strong, open, caring. No longer the scramble, the panic, the worry, whether I can do it, disappears. Because you never know whether you can do it. You never know what you can be. You can't know, you can't directly know the next second. You can't know whether you can be adequate for your sister, your dad, your somebody with cancer or whatever. You can't know. You can't know what to do. But you can know what you feel. And you can stabilize the feeling. And say, no, and say, stay with that and trust that from that place of balance and wholeness, as you enter into this active domain, stay with that, you'll find, you'll pop up. Oh, do that, don't do that, stop doing that. You'll probably find this thing you just stop doing rather than add more. Most of us are data filled. So no, I don't need to think about that. So part of it, you begin to relinquish this emotional debris of agitation and worry, which acts like a kind of clutter that clogs the system. Uh, and it just clogs us, so we don't get the clear readings. We get the readings of my worry is making me concern, am I getting it right for you? Is right? no, look, just don't worry, because then you won't be able to read the situation properly. <laughs> because you'll be bouncing off your own emotional noise. Don't expect to know what to do. Yeah. As I so often find in my life, in teaching, you know, I look at these things, teaching London Insight. I haven't got anything to say. I've got no idea what to do. I've been teaching for, since 1981, I've never had a clue as to what to say or what to do. <laughs> I wonder when somebody's going to find out I've got nothing to say. You realise if every every situation we're in, you see, another big, really problematic construction we probably all know about is this sense of the isolated self. And this is what time and the delusions of time and space, they're part of that. I'm a being who lives in a flat in Islington. I'm 43 years old. Yeah. I've got to get this done by Friday. That's little me in my little bubble. And my little bubble just about floats on an ocean of panic <laughs> and worry <laughs> and unfulfilled wishes and self criticism of not doing good enough <laughs> and fears about, you know, my this, that, and the other. The isolated self. And there isn't one. It's like time and space, you can construct it. 
And when you start to construct, you think, just a minute, let's do this quite clearly. Let's be very clear about this, who this person is. Right, let's get it absolutely clear. This person's in the body, right? Sure, you look in the mirror, that's that thing. No, you look, you, what you're seeing is an image in glass, right? You can't see your face. You see an image in glass. So let's get clear, you don't have a face. <laughs> you see an image in glass. And you believe that the image is telling you the truth. Right? Okay. You see a photograph. That's me, all right. Is it really you? Yeah, that's me. It's funny because you don't look like you're breathing. It doesn't look like your expression ever changes. It looks like you're kind of frozen, solid. They can't be. No, it's not me, it's an image. Well, it's not you then, is it? It's an image. Right? And you look at one, that was me ten years ago. Is that really you ten years ago? Yeah, that's me ten years ago. What happened to him? <laughs> Doesn't look like you now, does it? So who was he? I don't know what he looks like. <laughs> I've got images, pictures, and other people say, oh, you know, I think I'm kind of really weird looking guy. No, no, you look good to me. No, no, just flattering me, I'm a weird looking guy. My ears are too big. Nose is crooked. No, you're not, you're a fine looking guy. No, I'm not, you're just being silly. I don't know what I look like. So just give you that basic thing. Well, I've got a body. Yeah, sure. You have a spleen? Yeah, I've got a spleen. Prove it. Um, how about your lungs? Well, I must have lungs because I'm breathing in. And that's just something I told you in a book. You haven't got any lungs. <coughs> have you? Where are they? Can you feel them? Can you feel them all the time? Or is it sometimes I have lungs? When, when I'm coughing, I have lungs. The rest of the time, I don't have them. Where, where is he? Who is he? What kind of body is it? And this is just the both most basic level of form. What else are you? Well, I'm kind of, I suppose I know a bit about computer sciences, I've got this and the other, so that's what you are. Not really, those are just ideas of education I've got. So that's not really you, is it? No, that's the education I've got that's made me into that. So it's not you either, is it? All your learning isn't you. Your language you picked up because you have to live in this country, that's not yours either. Right? So your nationality is just a matter of where you got dumped when you got born. <laughs> so you're not really English or British or German or Belgian. Just, okay. Well, I'm streaming through a few bits. Now about, well, I'm a woman. Yeah, that's who I am, a woman. Yeah, so you've got, you've got female laughter, have you? There's something about your anger that's very female. But no, no man has anger, only women have anger. No, everybody's anger. Everybody has joy, everybody's happiness. So what's the, where's, your, where's your female bit? Okay, let's not go too intimate here, but... <laughs> <laughs> and how big a deal is that for you? Most of the time you're just a kind of weird little blob of thought, aren't you? Frankly. No specific gender, no specific nationality, no specific location, no specific time, no history. Just a weird blob of tangled emotions. But that changes too. <laughs> so who is this individual? What it, I'm telling you what it is. It's the accumulation of causes and conditions in the present moment that are being grasped at. Right? It's the accumulation of visual impressions, sensations, hmm? visual impressions, sensations, thoughts, attitudes, uh, programs, uh, hormones, um, energies. It's the accumulation of that and it's changing all the time. Shifting all the time. So it's a location for a certain accumulation of programs, conditions and and forces and energies. Right? And it's shifting all the time. But because it's, it's constantly being recreated, it's 
causes, conditions, as emotional patterns, as karmic tendencies, as programs, as socially induced customs, as ideas. It is not individual, it's a communal or a, a, you know, a coming together of forces that cannot be, we cannot separate it from the air around us. We cannot separate it from the culture. We cannot separate it from the parents. We cannot separate it from, it's just all bound up in that. There is no individual. So that may seem like nihilism, like I don't exist. Oh no, there's existence. But existence is cooperative, right? Because it's mutually conditioned, existence is cooperative. That is, there, are, there is this coming together of causes, conditions, and there's an awareness of that. The awareness of that responds. Because this is a coming together of causes and conditions, it's very significant and important that one manages, cooperates with, calms, steadies, blesses, gives kindness, cooperation, moral sensitivity to causes and conditions, because that's what we're all in. We're all nodes of this web uh, and if we r- realize this potential for our life there's a sense of because this is caught everything has a knock-on effect because it's all interwoven so my integrity or the integrity that's happening here is going to affect other beings it cannot not affect it just as my pettiness or jealousy is going to affect other beings, my magnanimity and so forth is going to affect other beings. It may not affect all of them over the world, but it's going to affect. It's going to have some effect. Now that may be just a nice idea, but what you can recognise, well, it affects this one right here, whether it's a self or not. <laughs> it means this one right here is. Steady, bright, open, dignified, balanced, responsive, poised, clear, empathic. That's not a bad place to start. And we'll see where it goes from there. So if we uh, dislodge the grip of these constructed uh, structures, time, space, identity. Not through negativity, just through clear, conscious, honest investigation. And learn being able to just face the truth and live in accordance with it. We're going to find this is for welfare internally, externally, and both. And this is exactly what the Buddha's path and teaching is about.